one of the things after the program, we'll, t we'll take this, I'll take this microphone around. Hello and welcome to the third presentation of the fall 2017 season of the Medical History Interest Group. I'm Melissa Nasia. This presentation is sponsored by the Lopez Library History Collections, which is just down the road, around, down the hall, and the Department of Bioethics and, Interdi and Interdisciplinary Studies. If you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance sheet. If you are attending as part of the ECU Wellness Program, uh, please see Lindsay at the end uh, so you can get your, your program stamped. We have one more uh, presentation this semester. On Monday, April 10th, Dan Shingleton, um, MSW, ECU Social Work Retired, will speak on, in the beginning, the Tar Heel State and Public Health. Today's presentation is called, called the Eastern North Carolina Midwife, Lovey Beard Shelton, 1950 to 2001. The presenter is Lisa Yarger. She has an MA in folklore. She's a freelance writer and a bookshop owner in Munich, Germany. Lisa Yarger is the author of Lovey, the story of a Southern midwife and an unlikely friendship, a narrative nonfiction book about North Carolina midwife, Lovey, uh, about a North Carolina uh, midwife named Lovey Beard Shelton that was nearly two decades in the writing. Lisa grew up in Raleigh. She studied English at Wake Forest University and, and, and earned a master's degree in folklore from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She met Lovey Shelton in 1996 while working on an exhibit at the North Carolina Museum of History. Since 2005, she has lived with her husband and daughter in Munich, Germany, where they own and operate the Munich Readery, an English language secondhand bookstore. And next to the sign-in sheet, there, is a, there are discount flyers um, on one of the small round tables if you'd like to purchase the book. We have several current exhibits, and all are on the fourth floor. Desegregation in Healthcare in Eastern North Carolina, Early American Woodworking, Exploring the Natural Beauty of Wood, um, an exhibition by Joseph Chalovich, Bausch and Lomb Microscopes from 1984 to 1972. And here is Lisa Yarger to speak on Call the Eastern North Carolina Midwife, Lovey Beard Shelton, 1950 to 2001. Lisa. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to everyone here who uh, worked on this behind the scenes. Um, I know a lot of people put a lot of work into this series, so thank you. Um, and also thanks to the Country Doctor Museum for bringing um, the exhibit, Annie and uh, whoever else helped with that. Um, so the title of my talk is a play on the wildly popular PBS series that some of you may know called The Midwife. So I stole that and added called The Eastern North Carolina Midwife. Um, if you don't know the show, it's set in London, the East End, in the East End of London in the late 1950s and focuses on uh, nurse midwives delivering babies in homes. Um, I've also got the word remarkable in my revised title, which I forgot to give Melissa. Sorry, Melissa. Um, like the book and movie character Forrest Gump that you may know, uh, who witnessed and sometimes influenced major events in the 20th century, I like to think of Levy Shelton as the Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump of the midwifery world. Um, and I think by the end of your, my presentation, you'll know why. Uh, her career just happens to dovetail a lot of the major events of midwifery in the 20th century, and it also allows us to just take a peek behind the scenes into home birth and midwifery through the 20th century. So how we met, um, that's me 20 years younger. Um, as Melissa said, I was working for the State History Museum as a folklorist. I was actually looking for a, a traditional African-American midwifery from Eastern North Carolina to help us tell the very rich tradition of midwifery in African-American communities in the eastern part of the state. But that tradition had largely died out by the late 1960s. And um, 
I called over to ECU to talk to Dr. Holly Matthews, who's sitting right here from the anthropology department. She's done some very important work with um, African American <coughs> midwives in North Carolina in the eastern part of the state. She told me about a woman. She said she's white, she's a nurse midwife. I know she's not what you're looking for, but she delivered babies in the same communities that you're interested in. So you might want to get in touch with her, and uh, she's also very interesting. And indeed, she was. So after the exhibit went up, um, Lovey actually, uh, uh, well, first of all, she donated a bag of her midwifery equipment to the museum. It's now in the permanent collection. And um, when the exhibit was up, I asked if I could write a book about her, and she, she agreed. So some background on her. She was born on her family's farm in Nash County in 1925 with a doctor in attendance. Most babies in the rural South were born at home at the time. If you're of Lovey's generation and you were born at home and are white and your family could afford it, you probably had a, a doctor at your birth. If you're of Lovey's generation and your family did not have resources, or if you're a person of color, you were likely brought into the world by a midwife. So in 1925, the year that Lovey was born, midwives attended about a third of all North Carolina births, including 71% of African American births and 14% of white births. And that year, North Carolina had 6,500 registered midwives, which was more than any other state in the country. Outside of the state's Appalachian region, the majority of the midwives were black. And uh, this is Holly's article, which has not, not got a complete citation because it's a, appeared in uh, multiple publications, but if you'd like that, I'll, um, I'll give it to you afterwards. I want to also just show you a couple of books that uh, I found really useful in doing research on African-American midwifery, and if I'm going too quickly, you can come up to me later, and I'll give you the titles. <clears throat> I got ahead of myself. So um, most black midwives did not have access to uh, formalized training. So when I say they were lay midwives or traditional midwives, I mean that they were community-based midwives who learned their vocation through an apprenticeship program, an apprenticeship system in their community from an aunt, a mother, a grandmother, or an older woman in the community. This is how they would learn their skills. Um, and most of them were older women or middle-aged women who had already given birth themselves. And this is why, in part, because of their age, um, they're often referred to as grannies or granny women or granny midwives. Um, as Holly Matthews has pointed out in her scholarship on African-American traditional midwives, there's a couple of issues at play here. Midwives were a traditional choice in many folk communities because they reflect the belief that the birthing room is a female domain. But beyond the, beyond the issue of choice, there's one of access. Even if a family desired and could afford a physician, there simply weren't enough doctors in North Carolina's eastern, uh, part, the, the eastern part of the state to serve the large rural population. White doctors were not always eager to serve black families, and black doctors were rare. So in answering a call, the midwife was performing what she saw as her duty to attend a woman in need. And Lovey herself was brought into the world, well, by her mother, but with a white doctor in attendance as were her siblings, but she had some contact with black traditional midwives on her family farm. Uh, the family rented out parcels of land to tenant families, most of whom were African American. And when a tenant woman went into labor, her husband would go up to the family farm and ask Lovey's father or brother to go fetch a midwife in the family Ford. So a midwife would come back and Lovey was just enthralled with the midwives. She wanted to get as close to them as possible. She would hang out in the cabins and though she never saw a birth firsthand, she got there by the time the baby was squalling almost is how she put it. And a second factor that played into her wanting to become a midwife is that she was really a farm girl. She loved animals. She was the outdoor chores person on her family farm, and she especially liked helping pregnant animals. When they started raking together leaves and sticks for nests, she was really aware of that process, and she liked to help. So here she is at age about 12 with one of her father's mules. And a third and final significant factor in paving her pathway to nurse midwifery was her mother's perspective on education. Mrs. Beard had only a third grade education herself, but she expected her daughters to go to college and pursue a career. And Lovey herself wanted to stay on the farm, but this is what her mother told her. You can't stay here. I can't take care of you forever, and you can't rely on men folks. They get sick and they die on you. You have to get prepared and learn how to take care of yourself. So Lovey hadn't heard of nurse midwifery at this point, but her older sister had started a nursing training program, so she thought that she would try that herself. 
She was 16 when she graduated high school, which was too young to start nursing school, so she enrolled at Atlantic Christian College in Wilson for a year. Now, by this point, the United States had been involved for, in, in World War II for about one year, and there was a nursing shortage on because so many nurses had volunteered with armed services. To address the nursing shortage, Congress passed the Nurse Training Act of 1943. It's named for Representative Frances Bolton of Ohio as a woman, and it established the U.S. Cadet Nurses Corps, through which hospitals would offer accelerated nursing training with subsidized tuition, so basically a faster, cheaper pathway to becoming a nurse. And here is a recruitment poster. They really played up the smartness of the uniforms. Um, this was so not of interest to Lovey. You saw her. She liked to have her picture taken with mules. But this is um, what they tried to do to encourage young women to uh, join. Only women. This was for women. Uh, so when recruiters for the Cadet Nurses Corps visited Lovey's campus in 1943, she signed up. And she started nursing training in 1944 at Norfolk General Hospital in Virginia and she became one of 18, sorry, 180,000 women to participate in the program before it ended in 1948. Um, Lovey always says, I was the biggest person in all my classes, so I think you could probably spot her. She's the tall one in the back, second from the left. Near the end of her training, she knew she wanted to work with women and babies by this point, and she carried out a six-month placement in the labor and delivery ward at Norfolk General. Now, by the time she started this placement, about 75% of American women were giving birth in the hospital. As a nurse, Lovey was trained to function primarily as a handmaiden to the doctor. That was Lovey's word, word, handmaiden. And I'm going to read her explanation of her role. When I read her voice, I, I like to do her voice because it brings you a little bit closer to who she was. My daughter finds this horribly embarrassing, but she's not here. <laughs> the nurse wasn't really responsible for the patient except getting the doctor there at the right time, or timing the contractions and putting her on the table and scrubbing up her bottom with her legs propped up. You prepared and set up the delivery room table, pulled the cloth off of it, and the doctor handed you the baby when it was born. It wasn't passed to the mother. She was passed out. She was anesthetized. You couldn't take the final responsibility for the birth, but you had to be sure you got the doctor there on time if it was at all possible. Sometimes the doctor depended on the nurses to tell him how far along the woman was and was she in really active labor. He'd say over the phone, give her such and such a drug, but call me when she's three-fourths dilated or when you can see the head crowning. All right, he might have to come 20 blocks across town and the baby's going to pop out before he gets there. So what were we supposed to do? Well, what we were doing was slowing her down. We'd pull her legs together and tell her to breathe through her mouth and not to push and all sorts of things like that just because of a doctor being across town. It didn't seem like the right kind of thing to do, but the nurses had to save their heads and save their jobs, and we were not supposed to make the mistake of letting the woman deliver without the doctor being there. So that gives you a little insight into hospital birth at the time. She graduated from nursing school in 1947. The war being over, she was free to return home to Bailey, and she got a job working for a country doctor who still attended home births, mainly of white women. This doctor took Lovey along to assist, and sometimes if her labor went on for a long time and he had to go see other patients, Lovey was left home with a laboring woman, and what happens when you're home with a laboring woman by yourself, sometimes you end up being the one who's there when the baby comes. So this is what happened, and Lovey had this to say, that's when I realized that I didn't know anything. She decided she wanted more training. She hadn't heard of nurse midwives, but she knew public health nurses worked in homes, so she enrolled at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Public Health Nursing, and the instructors brought in a guest lecturer, a woman named Laura Blackburn, who was a white public health nurse midwife who worked for the South Carolina State Board of Health. Though this woman occasionally attended home births, her primary function was to organize training for the traditional midwives, who were primarily black, practicing in the state. She talked to Lovey's class about the high infant and maternal death rates in rural areas and of the need for public health nurses in eastern North Carolina. This was the first time that Lovey heard the words nurse and midwife linked. It simply set me on fire to be a public health nurse midwife because they really thought that nurse midwives were the up and coming thing, that it was a way of improving the health care of mothers and babies. So she was so interested that her professors decided to send her out for more training to see if she was serious. So now we've gotten up to 1948, and in 1948 there were not very many places in the United States where nurse midwives were working, and there were even fewer where one could train. 
Anybody have an idea how many training programs for nurse midwives there were in the country in 1948? Just a guess. Three. Three. There was the Catholic Maternity Institute in Harlem. There, oh, sorry, in, so, <laughs> yeah, good. The, the Lobenstein Clinic in Harlem, the Catholic Maternity Institute in Santa Fe, and the Frontier Nursing Service in Kentucky's Appalachian Mountains, which I will refer to as the FNS because that's a lot shorter. Um, the FNS was in a three county area of Kentucky's Appalachian Mountains. It was in one of the poorest and most underserved regions of the country and it represented the very first and most famous introduction of nurse midwives into the United States. And this is where Lovey's professors sent her. So the Frontier Nursing Service was founded in 1925 by a wealthy American nurse and socialite named Mary Breckenridge. She had volunteered with the American Committee for, the Dev for Devastated France at the end of World War I. While in the French countryside, she came into contact with professionally trained British uh, nurse midwives. Now, Breckenridge knew that in the United States, the maternal death rate at the close of World War I hovered between six and seven women for every 1,000 live births. This meant that some 15,000 women were dying in childbirth every year. Breckenridge also knew that 16 other Western nations had lower maternal death rates than the United States, and that one thing these countries had that the United States did not have were professionally trained midwives who attended a large percentage of births. So Breckenridge was convinced that professionally trained nurse midwives could meet the maternity needs of a large percentage of the country's population, and she set out to prove it. The largest community in her chosen area of Kentucky had fewer than 500 inhabitants. Most of them lived in small cabins up remote, uh, remote coves. They were accessible only by horseback. And there is Mary Breckenridge herself, soon after the founding, I think. Uh, most of the area had no telephone service, so uh, to get to the nurse midwives, you had to be on a horse. But before the nurse midwives arrived in the area, so there, there were some doctors practicing, but they often took six to 20 hours on a horse to get to a patient. And often no, pa no doctor was available who could leave his patients for that long. Even if he was available, he would charge about a dollar per mile of travel. And uh, then he would sometimes add a $5 surcharge. And these were mountain families who were barely eking out a living, who maybe supplemented their income with railroad work or timber, but they, they were quite poor. So babies were largely brought into the world by granny, midwives, neighbors, or relatives. So because there were no professional training programs for nurse midwives in the United States at this time, Breckenridge's first recruits were either American nurses who she sent to the UK for training or British nurse midwives whom she imported to Kentucky, some of whom had never been on a horse before. And if you read some of the literature about the FNS, you get some funny stories about that. Uh, here is an early photograph of a lot of her nurse midwives on horseback. Like traditional midwives, FNS nurse midwives lived where they worked, which made them not only more accessible than doctors, but more affordable. The cost of an FNS birth, including complete prenatal and postpartum care, was $5. And if they, you didn't have cash, you could pay with butter, chestnuts, honey, guinea hens, firewood, quilts, animal skins, or homemade cane bottom chairs. That's an FNS midwife with a baby. Within seven years of its founding, the Frontier Nursing Service had compiled a record of 1,000 births without a single maternal death related to pregnancy or labor. FNS involvement had also drastically reduced the number of stillbirths and infant deaths. By 1940, the service had amassed a total of 4,000 births with only five maternal deaths, and the rate of interventions was also remarkably low. In the first 3,000 cases, there were four C-sections. When England and France declared war on Germany in 1939, most of the British nurse midwives returned home, and Breckenridge could no longer send American nurses to the UK for training. So she immediately began a training program in Kentucky. The first graduates stayed there to work, but by the time Lovey visited in 1948, Frontier Nursing Service graduates were working across America and around the world. And I'd like to read you Lovey's firsthand impressions of her time there because I find them very descriptive. So my professors arranged for me to go to the Frontier Nursing Service to meet Miss Mary Breckenridge and see what the nurses were doing and how they were operating and to go out with them on some cases. I didn't know anything about Kentucky, but I rode the train out there 
and I worked in the clinics which were spread out in these different coves and had names like Redbird and Confluence and stuff like that. The nurses were seeing patients all afternoon without a doctor and they would treat gunshot wounds and snake bites, give immunizations, stitch up somebody that had fallen or hurt themselves, give all sorts of advice and do all kinds of things that I had never known nurses in this country to do. And I went out with them to see patients that were in little cabins that were just hanging on the side of the mountain. I found a whole different culture than I was used to. I felt that I was no longer even in the United States. It was so different from Eastern North Carolina. I stayed up in Kentucky about three months, and at that time there were about 28 nurse midwives up there. There were cabins in each little cove, and there would be two midwives in each one and a horse pen out behind with two horses. And the women delivered in the homes, and the father would have to come out to get the midwife to go up there. They had a lot of work, the midwives did, because the women were just having babies like the Dickens up there. So her time there sealed her interest in, in nurse midwifery, and she asked Mary Breckenridge if she could stay and, or come back after she finished her public health degree and train as a midwife, but Breckenridge had already signed up three or four classes ahead and said, no, I'm full up, but if you're really interested, I might be able to help you. And so um, before Lovey knew it, in 1949, Lovey Beard of Nash County, North Carolina, a country girl who had never done anything, as she called herself, found herself admitted to the midwifery training program at the Simpson Memorial Maternity Pavilion of the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, Scotland, known around the world for its excellent teaching and care. It was in Edinburgh that Lovey came under the wings of yet another of the midwifery world's most prominent figures, Margaret Maggie Miles. And unfortunately, you can't see her very well in this, but you can see what her classroom would have looked like. This is a little bit before Lovey's time, but that is Margaret Miles at the chalkboard with some midwifery pupils. And that's how Lovey would have looked too, from behind at least, with her cap and midwifery uniform. Miles just happens to be one of the best known and respected teachers of midwifery ever. And she also authored the first textbook for midwives by a midwife. In 1953, this was published. Um, it became a standard text all over the world. Midwives knew it so well, they just called it the Midwives Bible or the Gospel According to Miles or just Miles. Um, here's Lovey with some of her sister midwifery pupils. The woman with the white cap is probably a tutor, but Lovey is third from the left. During the first phase of their training, Lovey and her classmates worked under the supervision of sister tutors, as they were called, at the Simpson. The home birth was still very common in Scotland for low-risk pregnancies. Women who delivered at the maternity pavilion either lived in substandard housing where home birth was not possible, or they had complications like diabetes or heart disease. Midwives delivered many of these patients, and an obstetrician only intervened if there was an emergency. In their second six months of training, Lovey and her classmates went out into Edinburgh homes by themselves, giving prenatal care, delivering babies, and conducting follow-up visits. Each midwifery pupil was called in rotation to handle deliveries. And I love this. So when a, whenever a client entered labor, a sister tutor would rap on the door of the pupil whose turn it was and say, you have 15 minutes to get ready. And 15 minutes after the official knock, a chauffeured Rolls Royce took the pupil off to her client to ensure that she arrived in good time, but she had to come home by streetcar. In 1950, when Levy graduated from the program at Edinburgh, Levy returned to North Carolina and landed an assignment as the first public health nurse ever in Pamlico County. Now, when Levy started work in Pamlico County, rates of tuberculosis were very high. She spent a lot of her time giving TB skin tests to people who worked in the seafood industry. She coaxed people into getting chest x-rays. She arranged treatment for TB positive in individuals and chased down people who weren't taking their medications. She immunized school children, treated countless cases of impetigo, and also established a maternity clinic and began supervising the handful of lay midwives, all black in this county, who were still attending home births in the county. And in, that, in doing so, she was following in the footsteps of Laura Blackburn, the nurse midwife from South Carolina who had so inspired her at, at UNC. So here we come to an interesting piece of history and a complicated one, and I have to backtrack a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, around World War I, America were, was coming to grips with the country's shockingly high maternal and infant mortality rates. So among the immigrant North and the African-American South, midwives were still delivering the majority of babies, and it was these women that the medical establishment blamed for the appalling statistics. 
Physicians used racial and ethnic stereotypes. They lambasted midwives as superstitious relics of a bygone era and called for their abolition. And here's a quote from the famous at the time and very influential obstetrician, Joseph DeLee. As long as the medical profession tolerates that brand of infamy, the midwife, the public will not be brought to realize that there is a high art in obstetrics and that it must pay as well for it as for surgery. Public health officials also had a stake in this debate about what was known broad and wide as the midwife problem. They pointed out that many women had no choice but to turn to midwives because of economic circumstances or rural isolation. And of course, racism and segregation also resulted in limited health care options for people of color. Most public health officials viewed midwives as a necessary evil and argued that they should be trained and regulated until adequate alternatives could replace them. So in 1921, Congress passed the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Protection Act, which subsidized midwife training programs. And in the South, this usually meant that white public health nurses like Lovey became responsible, responsible for bringing African-American midwives into the public health system. So how did this work exactly? Well, in supervising the county's remaining midwives, Lovey inspected their bags, checked their birth certificates, and made sure the patients got adequate pre- and postnatal care. She also implemented the state's plan to cut down the number of practicing traditional or granny midwives, the very midwives who had so fascinated her as a child. As Lovey put it, the state didn't come right out and say you're to eliminate all these women, but they came up with ways as they went along because she couldn't read or write or was in bad health. And the other things that the health departments did to get rid of the grannies, they automatically retired them when they reached the age of 70. They tightened the requirements for relicensing, and they made it harder for new midwives to get permits. And also, because the um, traditional apprenticeship system had been really disrupted by the interventions of health department officials, fewer younger midwives took up the practice. So you remember that in 1925, there were 6,500 midwives practicing in North Carolina. I didn't mention, but it's interesting. In 1917, they were 9,000. In 1950, by the time Lovey got to Pamlico County, there were 900 lay midwives or so practicing in North Carolina in Pamlico County. Where Lovey was, there were 10. So back to that uh, stereotyping by the medical establishment. In fact, a key study had shown that midwives who had received training from their county health departments compiled records for infant mortality no worse and sometimes better than those of doctors attending home births. The study also found very favorable maternal mortality rates for midwives in general and remarkably low rates for the mothers attended by trained and supervised midwives. As Holly Matthews has pointed out, midwives also gave vital assistance to their community by encouraging parents to have their children immunized, bringing pregnant women to health department maternity clinics for prenatal care, and generally serving as lay health advocates in their communities. And Lovey testified to this as well. That was a way of getting the patients to come to the clinic, you know, if the midwife would sort of insist. However, despite their proven value, their numbers were diminishing year by year. So on a personal note, Lovey married a sawmill man in 1950 named Marshall Shelton, and they moved together to Beaufort County. There she took a position with the Beaufort County Health Department as a public health nurse. And among her tasks were providing prenatal care and supervising the county's remaining lay midwives. Before long, her midwifery training got out and uh, just among the women that she was helping in the maternity clinics and some began asking her to attend their deliveries. So although Lovey was officially practicing with a granny midwife permit and that also limited what she could do, the area doctors told her, we want you to go ahead and do more than the grannies do and just call us when you need us. As Lovey recalled, the doctors were glad for her to take responsibility for patients they didn't really want in the first place. Um, they were white doctors. The people that Lovey was serving were mainly African American. Sometimes she would get paid, sometimes not. She never charged more than $40 for a birth, even for twins, her entire 50 year long career, if you can imagine. Women's pay, remember those issues? <laughs> Although the physicians in her area accepted and even welcomed Lovey's midwifery work, some of Lovey's nursing colleagues did not. Some had deep prejudices against midwives. They shuddered at the idea of home birth and thought midwives were backwards and that Lovey was taking the nursing profession back to the dark ages by delivering in homes. That was, that was an actual 
thing that somebody told her. She was not only the first nurse midwife to practice in North Carolina, but it, for years she was the only nurse midwife in all of Eastern North Carolina. And this lack of nurse midwife colleagues and lack of support from her nursing colleagues left her feeling extremely isolated a lot of the time. This is her business card. In 1957, she left the health department to go into full-time midwifery. She had enough clients. She had two children by this point, and she wanted to practice midwifery more than she wanted to do public health. The next 10 years or so were the peak years of her practice. She also had two more children in that period. Washington, North Carolina, Beaufort County was the hub of Lovey's work, but over the decades she attended births throughout Beaufort County and in most of the surrounding counties too, occasionally driving as many as 50 miles one way. And as Lovey liked to say, these were rural miles. <laughs> and this is a map of her territory. Um, pretty much any place that's named is someplace she would have would have delivered. Um, as you know, this area is dotted with marshes and lakes and some swampy areas. The roads can be wet and slick. Lovey learned to carry a tow train, a tow chain in case somebody had to pull her out of mud. In the early years of her practice, most houses didn't have a street number. And when she filled out a birth uh, certificate, the birth certificate, birth certificate requested instead of a street address, a road or nearest store, filling station, church, or crossroads. So that's how she also had to find these places without a street address. She dealt with storms and storm warnings, detours, rain, snow, hail, ice, flooding, and the occasional hurricane. Although she prim primarily delivered in the woman's home, she also delivered in each of her three bedrooms and once on the floor right inside her parlor door when a woman showed up and just, ha Lovey had only time to pull her inside, grab some towels, and boom, baby was there. And she also tells the story of how one time a log truck drove up into her driveway and she went out and there was a woman who had just given birth to a baby. She said it was a big mess. <laughs> and she cleaned up the woman, cleaned up the baby, brought them inside, waited for the placenta, cleaned her up again, signed up, filled out a birth certificate, sent them on their way, and she never saw them again. In one memorable year, she delivered 196 babies, which is a heavy workload if you consider that she often stayed with a woman 20 or more hours until the baby arrived. She accepted only low risk deliveries, but with birth, you sometimes get surprises. And she had her share of breaches and twins. She also handled emergencies such as extremely high blood pressure and hemorrhages. Two things had a huge impact on her career. The desegregation of hospitals through the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the introduction of Medicaid in 65. With these developments, many poor women and women of color who had been shut out of hospital care and had relied on midwives could now choose physician-attended hospital birth. Midwifery and home birth came more and more to be seen as outmoded, associated with poverty, racism, economic discrimination, and a past that many wanted to forget. And physicians who had previously avoided attending the births of poor women and women of color now recognized a new client base. So in 1968, only about 1.5% of all births were home births attended by, by midwives. That year, with her clientele dwindling, Levy returned to the Beaufort County Health Department where she would work for the next 20 years, so she had a steady salary. She had mentioned that her husband died in 1962, just six weeks after the birth of their fourth child, so she was the sole earner for the rest of that time. She never remarried. Although her clientele had dwindled, there were a few women who did not want a hospital birth. Some of these were afraid of hospitals. They saw them as places for the sick and the dying. Other women were simply used to midwives and saw no need to make a change. So Lovey kept going out to deliveries, but back at the health department, she now began butting heads with a new generation of doctors and public health officials who were not as supportive of her nurse midwifery work as the previous generation had been. I'm not talking about the nurses, I'm talking about the doctors and the public health officials. It's important to note that until 1983, there was no state law to regulate or even recognize or authorize the practice of nurse midwifery. Lovey had always practiced under what she called the granny law, with much leeway from older physicians who respected her training. For example, they knew she was doing vaginal examinations and giving pain medications. They would authorize that and give her the pain medications, and granny midwives were not, not doing that, or not, not supposed to. Now, however, officials made it clear that although she could function as a nurse at the health department, when delivering babies, she could do no more than what the law allowed her. In, no, in, in other words, no more than a lay or a granny midwife. So though she was an advanced practice nurse before that term came into common use, her scope of practice was severely limited by the law, at least officially. But she persevered. I've been trained, 
and I can't refuse my services, she told one health officer. She had a strategy that came out kind of slowly because she was a little circumspect about it. She had two bags. She told me about this very um, cautiously because she didn't want to get into trouble even, even when I met her. One bag was the midwifery bag, the granny midwife bag that she knew she was allowed to carry. The other bag was her more her bag from Scotland. They had all the stuff that a nurse midwife would have in it. And if she ever got her one bag inspected, it was the other bag <laughs> that uh, had the stuff in, in it that would have gotten her in trouble. According to Lovey, at one point a health officer here in Pitt County discontinued her midwifery permit for a while. Lovey already had three or four Pitt County women lined up for births and she told them they had to come deliver in her home in Washington if they wanted her as her midwife. So there were some Pitt County women that then had a Washington uh, delivery, a Beaufort County delivery. So Lovey was still attending a handful of home births a year, but both home birth and midwifery in North Carolina seemed to be on their way out in the late 1960s. And then a little bit later, something shifted. As part of second wave feminism, women began mobilizing to take more control over their lives and bodies. Some started to challenge the medicalized interventionist model of hospital birth. Some wanted to reclaim birth as a rite of passage an empowering and potentially transformative experience, a way to connect to their own bodies and realize their capabilities. They wanted birth attendants who took more time with them, who were committed to viewing birth not as a medical experience, but as a natural, normal event where their role was to accompany the woman more than to actively manage their labor. Some of these women started having their babies at home. Svea Oster, who was a birth educator from Durham, active in the home birth scene in the late 1970s and early 80s, had this to say, for a lot of people who had a sense of their own personal empowerment, what was going on in hospitals was just a horror. It would be their second baby where they'd say, I'm not going to let this happen to me again. And they would seek something outside of institutionalized care. In North Carolina, as elsewhere in the country, most of the women and families turning to home birth were white, middle and upper class, and university educated. Some were alternative mindset people, as Oster put it, while others were conservative Christians. If you think of the home school movement, um, home school community, you can see parallels. They read books such as Suzanne Arms' Immaculate Deception, A New Look at Women in Childbirth in America, and I like this one because it's got a real long title, Childbirth at Home, Why and Wherefore and How to Have Your Baby in the Relaxed Atmosphere of Your Own Home, Aided by Your Husband and in the Presence of Your Loved Ones. They were inspired by midwife Ina Mae Gaskin, whose book Spiritual Midwifery described the intentional community in Tennessee called The Farm, where she and other self-trained midwives attended births with extraordinarily good outcomes. A few hippies, as Lovey called them, found her and engaged her as their midwife, and I tell the story of one such birth in my book. She didn't understand them, <laughs> but she delivered them. Lovey, as always, was a rarity. Many women who wanted a home birth in North Carolina at this point did not have access to a midwife, let alone a professional one. In parts of the South, women did seek out the few remaining traditional midwives that were still practicing. In North Carolina, however, there were fewer than 10 midwives with valid permits in 1980. Most of these were here in the state's eastern counties, far removed both geographically and culturally from the majority of women who were interested in home birth. So a new kind of midwife emerged to fill the void, young white women in urban areas who wanted home birth. These women found one another, shared information, got help in some cases from nurse midwives and sympathetic doctors, and sometimes they just delivered each other at home. They did not know about Lovey. Had they known about her, they would have seen her as a resource. When suddenly in the late 70s, a number of this new breed of lay midwives started coming out, out of the woodwork to apply for midwifery permits, the state of North Carolina was caught off guard. The state thought and possibly hoped that midwifery was dead. What happens next makes for a long story. I tell the long version in my book, and I am again in debt to Holly Matthews for her scholarship. The short version is that the state issued a moratorium on new midwifery permits, <clears throat> established a midwifery study committee, which met <clears throat> between 1981 and 1983. And in 83, the General Assembly passed House Bill 814, an act to regulate the practice of midwifery. Now some things about this new law. Nurse midwives were finally recognized and authorized to practice, but only under the supervision of a physician licensed to practice medicine who was actively engaged in the practice of obstetrics. The new legislation was problematic for a number of reasons. For starters, it did nothing to address the abysmal state of maternal and infant care in rural North Carolina. In 1988, five years after the passage of the legislation, North Carolina had the second worst infant mortality rate in the country. Hospitals in eastern North Carolina were few and far between. 
and the state had one of the lowest ratios of doctors per capita in the, in the country. Granny midwives were no longer practicing in Eastern North Carolina. The state had pretty much seen to that by stamping out the tradition. Some health officials suggested that certified nurse midwives could step in to fill the void, but there were only a handful of certified nurse midwives in the state at the time, and there was no CNM training program. Even if there had been enough CNMs to serve the state's rural eastern population, the language in the new law restricted them from working independently, and uh, under which doctors would they have practiced given that eastern North Carolina suffered from chronic physician shortages. The new law did not offer a licensing pro process for lay midwives or direct entry midwives as they were coming to be called, regardless of their training or experience. They basically outlawed any midwife who was not a, a CNM. The new law did include a clause declaring that any person who on October the 1st, 1983, had been a practicing midwife in North Carolina for more than 10 years may continue to assist at childbirth. And it was this, they call it the grandfather clause, but midwives call it the grandmother clause, as it came to be known that directly affected Lovey. Although she was a registered nurse with professional training as a midwife, she was in the eyes of the law a lay midwife for the simple reason that she no longer held membership with the American College of Nurse Midwives and didn't have a graduate degree in midwifery. She had registered with the American College of Nurse Midwives in 1959, um, you know, a few years after she'd come back from Scotland, but she let her membership lapse. She didn't have a lot of money. The state of North Carolina didn't authorize nurse midwives, so she really didn't see the point. So starting at, sorry, if the, if my slide's not that great, but these were some brochures that just show you um, the promotional brochures for certified nurse midwives. And in 1983, they finally did get recognized by the state of North Carolina. And um, with studies showing that bringing midwives into an area resulted in healthier mothers and babies, the state did eventually decide to invest in midwifery. In 1989, the General Assembly, Alli Assembly allocated funds to establish four teams of nurse midwives in critically underserved areas of eastern and western North Carolina. And it was the same legislation that laid the groundwork here at ECU to start a master's level program in 1992 to train nurses in midwifery. Suddenly, after decades without colleagues, Lovey had a number of younger nurse midwives teaching, training, and working close by. Two certified nurse midwives working in nearby counties heard about Lovey and befriended her, and as a result, the American College of Nurse Midwives North Carolina chapter invited her to attend its annual meeting in 1997. She was presented at the meeting as a pioneer nurse midwife, and she walked on air for months afterwards. It was a huge boost to her. There was something that befuddled her, though, she, she came back and she said to me, you know what they're talking about today? The aromas of childbirth. <laughs> and she said, the only thing I know about the aromas of childbirth is blood and feces and urine and sweat. So she wasn't quite sure what they were talking about. <laughs> and also when I was pregnant, I told her about my prenatal yoga class and she just didn't even know where to begin. Um, contact with younger nurse midwives cut two ways for Lovey. Younger nurse midwives were calling her a pioneer, which thrilled her, but it also got her started on a painful line of thinking. If she was a pioneer, what difference had her work made? Why, didn't people, why did people continue to think of midwives as second-class caregivers? This is Lovey's thinking at the time in the 1990s. Why weren't things any easier for this younger generation of nurse midwives? So this is what she was left with at the end of her life because many of the younger nurse midwives that she was befriending were struggling with the practices that they were in. Some eventually moved out of the area. She wasn't sure where it was going. Um, so I don't want to leave you with that sad note because there's a lot of hopeful things that I hope will come out as people talk today. So I'll leave you with this picture. Um, in the 1980s, Lovey began working with Mennonites the, who live in Hyde County. There's quite a community there. Uh, families tend to be large. She was invited to attend the births. They saw her as a sort of necessary evil because she was an outsider. Um, but uh, she attended a great number of births in the Mennonite community. Um, became also um, the midwife to people who were neighbors with Mennonites, including one family, um, Joy and Kenny, who invited me to be a part of their baby's four, their fourth baby's birth. And this is a picture of that baby, Eli, who was born at home in 2001, and it ended up being Lovey's last delivery. And I chronicle that delivery in my book, and I was honored and privileged to be a part of it. So um, this is Lovey Shelton, and she's got a denim hat on because she always followed the rule that she learned in Scotland to cover your head, and she forgot her cap. And she was very embarrassed by that because she knew I was writing for the book, but she left on the hat that she had worn to the delivery, which is her favorite hat because she said it made her feel jaunty. 
So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So um, please raise your hand if you have any questions. What year, uh, what year did she finish pra uh, last practice? This baby was born in 2001. Okay. Yeah. I don't have a question, I actually have a comment. Um, I'm Becky Bagley, Director of the Nurse, Nurse Midwifery Education Program here at ECU. And I just wanted to comment um, where things are going now. Yes. We currently have a bill um, that looks like it may get passed. Um, it's called the Modernization of the Nurse Practice Act, where we're going to hopefully remove the supervision in our language so that nurse midwives can go out in these rural areas and not have to have the physician. Um, of course, we'll always, we'll always have physician backup, yes. but not have the physician supervising. Right. Uh, Professor Bagley answer, really answered my question, but I also had to take the opportunity to thank her because she was my midwife. <laughs> uh, Judith Kasperic, um, are other states as rigid in their rules about nurse midwives? We were, my babies were born in the early, well, 69 and 70 in California which is another bag of, uh, another kettle of worms, I guess. But even then in 1970 in California, there were a lot of uh, home births and water births and all mm -hmm. kinds of weird births that were attended by <laughs> non-doctors, of course. And I wondered if other states were as rigid in their um, uh, supervisory requirements for nurse midwives and in their licensing requirements and things. Do you know? I'm going to start answering it, but I'm going to then pass it over to Becky to finish answering it. Um, as far as I understand it, North Carolina is one of the most restrictive states as far as all kinds of midwifery goes. Um, and you can answer more than that. But, and also there's a, another designation called certified professional midwives that are not recognized in this state. It's only a handful of states in the country that doesn't recognize that, and North Carolina is one. So overall, it's one of the most restrictive states. Currently, North Carolina is one of six states in the United States that still requires the supervision um, in the language, one of six. I was one thing. Yeah, just about the, the need for <clears throat> nurse midwives and midwives <clears throat> throughout the rural parts of the country. Um, I learned recently that um, one reason that the c-section rate in our country is so extraordinarily high is that women in rural areas are scheduling c-sections at hospitals because they live so far away from anybody that can deliver their baby that they do not think that somebody can get there in time but they can get there in time they worry about that so they go ahead and schedule a c-section that's not what c-sections are for you know we need c-sections but they're for emergencies it's not supposed to be because there's nobody around to deliver your baby that you have to schedule one so this is what um, you know this nurse modernizing nurse practice act could help with is allowing nurse midwives to practice more freely in rural areas where there is a true dearth of um, of health services maternity services in our state of north carolina there's um, 31 of 100 counties that have no obstetrical provider or obstetrician, I should say. There may be a family practice physician, but no obstetrician or nurse midwife. I have just it's a comment, not a question. I had midwives at the births of both of my children. The first one was born in Italy, and she was very closely supervised by the physician. The second baby was born in West Virginia and we were at a freestanding birthing center and my husband's a physician and his colleagues gave us no end of trouble why would I want to do that mm -hmm. and really that discrimination was still there mm -hmm. that was 1990 yeah 
and it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. He's a very healthy fellow. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody did well. And yeah. we went home six hours later and yeah. no problems. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just have a comment. I'm Holly Matthews and um, so proud of Lisa for finishing this book. <laughs> <laughs> a labor of love. And I've been thinking about it being Women's History Month and mm -hmm. we hear about a few famous women every year during Women's History Month and how wonderful it is to have this story told about someone who went about it in her ordinary life mm -hmm. and made such a huge difference mm -hmm. to people. And I thought one of the important points she made is she was thanked, I'm sure, by the women she served, but not necessarily by the larger community. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine it meant everything to her to know you were doing this project and also that she got honored at the, yeah. at the end of her life. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful book, so I recommend you all. Thank you. Read it. Is she still alive? No, she died in 2013. Oh. We need to get that. We need, uh, okay. I don't remember if you said, I was just wondering what had happened to the FNS. The Frontier Nursing Service, uh, it's not called that anymore, it's called... It's Frontier Nursing University. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get... Okay, because there's another microphone here, actually, oh. yeah. Okay. They're still delivering babies and they're still training midwives. And you said that's fr the Frontier... The Frontier Nursing University. It's actually one of the largest um, universities or nurse midwifery education programs in the country. Um, they graduate about 168 nurse midwives a year. Um, they're all over the country, so it's a distance ed program down. They also have a nurse practitioner program that goes with it, so you can graduate as a nurse midwife and a um, family nurse practitioner. It's a great program, mm -hmm. but, but not as good as ours here. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I found very interesting is this urge to go back to midwives was coming largely from educated, college educated women. Mm -hmm. I was born in 53 and I was breastfed and my mother says that at the time the people who were breastfeeding were college educated women, which she was, and the very poor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would, would, Becky, would you like to comment on breastfeeding, you know, today, it's, on the percentages? Or? I might not be as up on that one. <laughs> um, I, I would say, say that the college-educated woman is probably more likely to breastfeed than the, um, the uneducated. But we have a public health nurse here who might be able to answer that a little bit better. Terry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly do encourage um, breastfeeding, but also, too, it, it has to do with readiness and the willingness of the mother. I mean, we certainly will um, promote it as much as possible and be there for support. But we see, and that is definitely, from a public health point of view, the, the best, um, and that's what we want to encourage. But if a mother doesn't feel like it's right for her, we're going to support her in her choice, too. Thank you. Um, I'm the physician, and uh, what I did, I had to go to the literature and find uh, that, uh, New England Journal, by the way, that uh, births on, uh, with a midwife, if there was no risk uh, ahead of time, uh, the results were about the same as in very expensive, uh, you know, medical facilities. But I do have a comment, a question. He's my husband, and he fully supported what I was doing. So I had to show them the article from the New England Journal. But my question is, if you look at the United States, uh, last year, the year before, about 800 women died of infant mortality in the United States. That is a rate of 18 per 100,000, which is double what it was in the early 80s. We're now like China. What happened? And I can't answer that. I'm going to give it a shot. 
Um, I believe some of it is because we're intervening more than we used to, so we're inducing women. Um, when, when you bring them in for inductions or when women come in in labor into the hospital and we tend to intervene, we want to get them out more quickly, so we break their water, which leads to other interventions. If they don't move on, we start Pitocin, and if that doesn't work, and it leads to C-sections and surgery. I mean, a cesarean is major surgery, and so, I mean, there's risks involved with that. But also, I think the obesity rate, which has increased, has made a difference in women being sicker. Um, so I think, I think the combination of the two, personally. I think that Ben happens to me. I think uh, advances, too, like 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we didn't have as much as advancement in infertility. So there's women now who are able to get pregnant that probably would never have had a pregnancy 25, 30 years ago. So they're probably going into pregnancy slightly, not slightly, but higher risk. You know, our diabetics, our patients who've had long-term infertility are now getting pregnant. Advanced maternal age. I mean, we have people who are in their 40s getting pregnant with IVF now that probably wouldn't have gotten pregnant. And my question, uh, my question on all of that is, is the statistics being kept better today or in the past? Sometimes that is a, um, affects what we're doing and, and is it getting, are they getting, including more people than in the past? And I have no idea, but I hope this is the kind of question I, I kind of wonder about. Anything else? Okay, um, if you are on the Wildest Passport program, check with Lindsay. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.